So that uh, that goes into um, Salim Khan's question. He's interested in your take on uh, what it would take to have a working quantum computer. So do you think it will be this understanding of further understanding of these Bose-Einstein condensates? Well, a quantum computer goes beyond silicon. Yeah. So, for example, uh, some of my friends who work on robots mm -hmm. say that since silicon power doubles every 18 months, by 2050, we're all going to be in zoos. <laughs> Our robot creations will throw penis at us and make us dance behind bars, just like we make bears dance behind bars today. Right. Wrong. <laughs> There's a problem. Okay. By 2020, we will exhaust the power of silicon, as I mentioned, and it's not clear whether robots will be super particle, powerful by 2050 because Moore's law is going to collapse. Right. Quantum computers, however, are not ready for prime time yet. Mm -hmm. The world's record for a quantum computation with a quantum computer was set by IBM. The calculation was 3 times 5 equals 15. <laughs> That's the world's record, even today, for a quantum calculation. Why is it so important? That calculation yeah. was done on atoms, right. individual atoms, all vibrating in synchronization. The tiniest vibration, cosmic rays from outer space, could ruin the coherence, and your calculation is uh, out the window. Right. But we think that quantum, computer, co quantum computers could be the way of the future if we can master the problem of decoherence impurities, a truck going by, vibrating, and all of a sudden your atoms don't vibrate in unison anymore. Or just radiation. So if we're Cosmic using, rays. yeah, if we're using computers, these quantum computers in the future, say in outer space, you know, where their rays were not as protected, you know, mm -hmm. by our electromagnetic field like the planet Earth is, but out in space they would be decohered very easily. Right. So the good news to all of this is that maybe we won't have robots in 2050 that are smarter than us. But the bad news is we don't know what's going to replace silicon power. Maybe mm -hmm. Silicon Valley will be replaced by a quantum valley if somebody mm -hmm. masters the art of computing on atoms rather than computing on silicon. All right. Your Pentium chip today has a layer of about 20 atoms across. The Pentium chip that you hold in your hand, 20 atoms across. In 10, 15 years, it's going to be five atoms across. At that point, quantum mechanics takes over. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle takes over. You don't know where the electron is anymore if your Pentium chip has a layer five atoms across. Leakage, heat, all these things destroy Moore's law. What we need is a replacement because this will determine the next Silicon Valley. I repeat, the next Silicon Valley will be determined by who can create a successor to silicon. Now, in some sense, this is very similar to what happened a hundred years ago with the invention of the light bulb. You see, a hundred years ago, we knew the laws of electricity. Faraday, Maxwell worked out the laws. It was an engineering problem for people like Edison to try hundreds of different chemicals, trial and error, until they finally found tungsten which makes light bulbs possible. The physics was known, the engineering was not. Today, we know the physics of quantum computers. Atoms, for example, can spin up in a magnetic field, or they can spin down. If they spin up, we can say this is a zero. If they spin down, this is a one. This is how we can put digital on atoms. But you see, atoms are much cleverer than that. They can not only be up or down, they can be anywhere in between. This means that quantum computers are almost infinitely more powerful in principle than what you can do with zeros and ones. This is the reason why some of the biggest names in the digital revolution are jumping on the bandwagon. Google is now investing in superconducting qubits. These things that go up or down or in between are called cubics, quantum bits. So Google has entered the picture. Microsoft is backing a, a dark horse, topological qubits. So Microsoft is jumping into the game. Intel, a master of silicon, is using silicon quantum dot technology to create quantum computers. IonQ is using ion traps. 
five different versions of quantum computers, just like what happened a hundred years ago. Now, who is going to win this race? Well, it was not clear that Edison and his colleagues would win the race for a light bulb. It was trial and error. We are in that realm today. It could take decades. It could take tomorrow, or it could take decades, just like with Edison. As Edison once said, genius. Genius is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. And now let me say a few things about what you can do with a quantum computer. First of all, the tipping point is 49 qubits. If you can create a quantum computer with 49 qubits, you're now neck and neck with ordinary digital computers using Pentium chips. 49 qubits is what you need. But beyond that, we can now begin to model quantum processes like chemistry. Chemistry is built on quantum mechanics, the mechanics of atoms, atomic physics. But we don't know how to model them. They're too complicated. For example, photosynthesis. Something as basic as photosynthesis, we don't know how to model using pure mathematics. Or for example, Alzheimer's. Some people think that the Alzheimer's molecule, the amyloid protein, is created by folding incorrectly. And that's why millions of people go crazy. But no computer is powerful enough to model the folding of the prions that some people think is responsible for Alzheimer's disease. What I'm talking about is doing chemistry from first principles. Chemistry reduced to software so that we don't have to play with thousands of different kinds of antibiotics, thousands of kinds of plastics, thousands of different kinds of, of, different kinds of chemicals. We can do it using software in a quantum computer. As you can see, this could change everything. Not only that, but the next big science project is the Connectome Project. The Manhattan Project gave us the atomic bomb. The Genome Project gave us the human genome. The third great initiative could be the Connectome Project to map the entire human brain. And that may take a quantum computer. And this means that in the future, communications could be done mentally. What I'm saying is that the internet will be replaced by BrainNet. We will send emotions, feelings, memories on the internet. The first memories in animals was sent on the internet two years ago. Two years ago, we can now upload memories, simple ones, and download memories in mice. Now we're doing it with chimp chimpanzees and apes. Next will be Alzheimer's patients. Alzheimer's patients will have a, a chip. You push the chip, and all of a sudden, memories go floating into their hippocampus. This may be the way that we communicate with our fellow human beings via the internet, via a new form of the internet called BrainNet. So we're talking about a new revolution in science. The next revolution is artificial intelligence. Some people think that artificial intelligence is the fourth wave of wealth generation. The first wave was steam power, which gave us the Industrial Revolution. The second wave is electricity, giving us the Electric Revolution. The third wave is the transistor and high technology, giving us the Digital Revolution. The fourth wave, the fourth wave of wealth generation, the fourth wave could be artificial intelligence, biotech, and nanotech. And what unites all three could be quantum computers. Now, some people think, well, gee, can computers get, oh, I think I'm running out of time. So, sorry about that. But anyway, this is just the beginning of the story. When will we have quantum computers? If I knew the answer to that, I would be a billionaire. Sorry about that. Okay, there is, in my book, I have a chapter on quantum consciousness which is perhaps the most bizarre form of consciousness in all of science. 
According to the quantum theory, in order for something to exist, somebody has to look at it. Somebody has to make an observation. Before you thing, in principle, it could exist in all possible states. When you look at it, it then assumes one state. Therefore, the observer, in some sense, determines existence. But observation requires consciousness. Conscious people make the observation. So the greatest paradox in all of science is the cat problem, the Schrodinger cat problem. If I have a cat in a box and I, I don't open the box, the cat could be either dead or alive. So how do we physicists describe a cat that you cannot observe? Well, we add the dead cat to the live cat. We add the two waves together. So the cat is neither dead nor alive until you open the box. Now Einstein thought, this is stupid. I mean, how can you be neither dead nor alive at the same time? Well, what can I say? Einstein was wrong. Electrons can be spin up or spin down. Electrons can be here or there at the same time. So this is the greatest paradox in all 